long-term career viability. The session will be chaired by Professor Hemlata Bagla, who is Vice Chancellor, HSNC University, Mumbai. She is a distinguished scholar and a trailblazing educationist and an international, internationally recognized authority in nuclear and radiochemistry. Dr. Bagla has earned a place in the prestigious 75 Women in Chemistry list by Royal Society of Chemistry, representing sole scientist uh, in India in 15-member team at International Atomic Energy Agencies for coordinated research projects on medical devices. She, of course, is a recognized uh, authority in nuclear and radiochemistry and has di guided numerous students also. I would request Dr. Suresh Ukrande, who is principal uh, Sumaya Engineering College, to please welcome her. It matches. <laughs> it matches well. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, sir. Sir, please be here because we have a couple of more people. Yeah. Dr. Dharmesha is currently Vice Chancellor of Indrashil University, Gujarat. Previously, he served as faculty head of department in electronics and communication department as de and dean of the engineering faculty at North Gujarat University, Patan, dean Gujarat Technical University, Ahmedabad, and academic uh, director of Nutan Sarva Vidyalay, K Kelwani Mandal Visnagar. I think it's Visnagar. Visnagar, provost of Sankcha Patel University, Visnagar also. He's also a freelance consultant for various industry projects and AERB related consultancy services for type approval authorization, etc. I request Dr. Suresh to once again, you know, welcome him. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Harpreet Kaur, who is currently the Vice Chancellor of National Law University, Jodhpur. She was also the former officiating Vice Chancellor, Registrar, and Professor at National Law University, Delhi. She has previously been Professor and Dean at the Institute for Integrated Learning and Management, Graduate School of Management, Greater Noida. She has developed and taught interdisciplinary co uh, courses on law for managers from different streams of management education, including international business laws and legal aspects of retail and banking businesses, besides co-authoring number of textbooks. Thank you uh, for being here. Uh, I request Dr. Suresh to welcome her on stage. Thank you so much. We have, we also have with us uh, Shri Ajit Gulabchand, who is ch Chairman and Managing Director at, of HCC, one of India's leading construction companies, founded by industrialist Seth Walchand Hiran Chand at, in uh, 1926. At the helm of affairs in HCC since 1983, Mr. Gulabchand's path-breaking management initiatives have grown HCC into a modern and vibrant infrastructure player. With a vast business portfolio and a knowledge asset and an expertise of more than 3,000 professionally qualified people. Mr. Gulabchan serves as Chairman of the Board of Governors at the National Institute of Construction Management and Research, NICMAR, and as Chairman of Walchan College of Engineering, Sangli. He is the founding member of the World Economic Forum's Disaster Research Network and a member of the National Council for Con Confederation of Indian Industry, CII. Um, I would request uh, yeah. Dr. Suresh to welcome him on stage. Yeah.
Thank you so much, sir. Thank you very much. Before we begin the session, I'd like to give details of the structure of the session, which are as follows. We will have opening remarks by the chairperson, followed by uh, each speaker who will speak on their respective themes, and then an open house discussion and question answer session, and then the concluding remarks by the chairperson. Uh, I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Sa Bagla to come he here and begin the session. Thank you so much. Would you require these? Good afternoon, dignitaries on and off the days. How the day turns out, you never know. In the morning when shawl was being offered to Pankaji, I admired it. And I wanted uh, from where it was bought from so that we can also order. And I got one. I could have wished something more today morning. So welcome back after your sumptuous lunch by Som Somaya Vidya Vihar University. As always, they are so warm. So thank you very much, Dr. Pillai and the team. Coming back to the session, and this is on sustainable careers, navigating a dynamic landscape, work landscape. As vice chancellor, as the leaders, education leaders, we are expected to think about what are the sustainable careers, but more than that, how in future we need to navigate uh, a work landscape for our students, our learners too. So I believe that it, it involves constant uh, uh, and continuous learning. Adaptability is the very profound word, I would say, uh, including all the education leaders, all of us, and even the learners, and now lifelong learners how an even pandemic has taught us this wonderful word, which is adaptability, and also continuously embracing change. So when we are ready, only then our learners, our students will be ready. So we need to cultivate uh, a growth mindset amongst, amongst all of us and even our students. And if we are staying attuned uh, with the industry trends, only then we will be able to implement the dynamics and curriculum and we have to see to it that how we integrate uh, versatile skills so that our learners are ready. I need to add much more, uh, but without wasting much time, it's also about integrating with AI, how we need to explore the intersection of artificial intelligence, uh, future work culture, which is crucial, but we would hear from our three dynamic speakers. We have Sri Ajit uh, Gulabchanji, uh, the first person who will start speaking, chairman and managing director of one of the India's leading Hindustan construction company. And then we move on to the second speaker, uh, Dr. Dharmesha, Vice Chancellor Indrashil, University of Gujarat. And finally, we would hear from the dynamic lady, Professor Dr. Harpreet Kaur, uh, Vice Chancellor, National Law University, Jodhpur. So over to them, I shall take my seat and I would request uh, Sri Ajit Gulabchan ji to take forward the proceedings of this session. Good afternoon, friends. It's been a privilege and honor to come and speak here on this very important subject of sustainable careers. From the number of people that have spoken and from, from the program you will see, I'm the only odd man out who is from the corporate sector. The reason I'm here is not because I'm corporate sector as much as the sponsor on behalf of my industry of the National Institute of Construction Management, which has now become a private university called Nikmar University. And this university will be built environment university. So everything that's got to do with the environment, whether it is construction, followed by the facility that you're building, the materials that you're using, the architecture and structural balances of that, the facility management of that, asset management of that, urban development, urban operations, the whole host of different competencies come into play when you discuss 
uh, urban environments. So it is with this view that I have been doing this. I'm also the chairman of Walshan College of Engineering. And based on this, I've had a fairly good connection with the world of education. And it is something we need more than anything else at this point of time. Education and health is the first need of this country. And I think the government is increasingly recognizing that and moving so. However, we still spend too little as a percentage of GDP on education. And we need to at least quadruple that, if not more, in order to get some effective education into the country and its students. So coming to the subject on hand, most important thing about this is that we have now in the world become a world a society of institutions. Anything we do, we build an institution. There used to be a cobbler before, now you have Bata and Nike. Everyone is now creating an institution to deliver the needs of society. And this is where we come in, that if you have to deliver the needs of society, we need to comprehend what is that need that society needs in order to to be a more sustainable society itself. Leave alone having yourself a sustainable character, a sustainable <coughs> job. The important thing here is that when you look at anything you do, you are providing a need of society. That's why you created this institution. But that's why you developed a competency that can help deliver that. And when you want to do that, you need to understand one more thing, that whilst we are delivering this thing, how competent, there are two sources here. One is where, how much knowledge should be, uh, at, uh, should be parted to the, to the student, and how much skill. Because both are now required for most people to work, except scientists and researchers who have to work in terms of doing their job purely as a educational qualification. Now, everything is becoming more and more outcome-based because without that, we are not able to measure what we are delivering. And for many things, it is given as those who would, they're looking for jobs. Am I providing an education that will enable him to get that job? And would that the job be enough? Or does he need continuing agency education in order to complete that, to continue with that job? So when you have this big dichotomy that confronts you, what is that need of education that you are fulfilling? Each institution, each university needs to work that out with clarity and say, this is what we are going to provide. And measure it against the output in the sense, does, does the is the student you educate get a job? Is he happy with the job? Can he change if tomorrow things change? Because everything is changing all the time. Just till last year, we, AI was a remote possibility. And suddenly it has become the topic of every day. And everybody is using AI rather wrongly because it's fully not there. And what gets called as machine learning gets passed off as AI. So there is much more to be done, but it'll get there. It'll get there faster than we imagine. Now, when these things start happening, they completely create disturb, disruptions in society, in the way we work, in what we do, what are the immediate requirements of, of businesses, of governments, of uh, policing agencies, of hospitals, a whole variety of needs which society has. How would these new technologies that come up will be able to, to deliver what the society needs? This is a very important aspect. And I have to build my institution around it. So in order to be able to build that institution, we really need to study what precisely is required. Uh, it's not as simple as you think. We need to think very hard, debate very hard. What, for example, in engineer, 
what is the what is the kind of engineer the 21st century needs can he be just a civil engineer does he need to have multi multiple uh, dimensions does he need to even add philosophy to his thinking not to only know how to do engineer something but why is it there what are the ethics behind using it and creating things all of these are new ideas which allow us to to bring into the field of education though most of the science education is not liberal arts but the education quality has to have what liberal arts says liberal because it teaches you the fundamentals of knowledge and art because it's a practice so with these two features you have to apply to every scientific education as well is this how we are going to train them then how do we say that when society needs trade how will you retrain yourself so without fundamental education without understanding the fundamentals of knowledge it is not possible to create that change overnight and when you create that change you have to practice it regularly to be able to make it happen to you so that you can continue to have your job continue to have your you know i use the word job for anybody having being an entrepreneur as well these are the days that everybody was to be a startup for a country who made patents only to deliver papers at conferences not one man i do i know who has become rich on his patent this is what is there everywhere people make patents so they can make money out of it if you don't so we need to learn to understand how we are going to use this knowledge that we get created when we create a patent we create a certain new stream of knowledge a new process how do we use it for society so that it will be sold everywhere and you will also be able to make money here again it's important to teach our children that it is important to have profit without which none of these things will become sustainable it's really profit is at the end a cost to the person who delivers it he has to make the profit to defray his cost of in business to defray the cost of obsolescence whatever happens to replenish it to finance growth so it's not whether profit but how much profit is necessary to keep this cycle going and making the business sustainable and that same principle applies to the knowledge of the individual you're teaching how do i upgrade myself from time to time to keep up with the changes that are happening in the competencies that i am good at at the same time what if suddenly there is no competency it did happen the only example that very quickly comes to mind is you will see in front of us how we had long playing records gramophones and from there we migrated through tapes and discs and to suddenly completely disc free simple pen drive that delivers to you music now these are things that change then what happens to the industry that came before it it dies so keeping cope with what is happening in your field anticipating some of the things and even if you don't anticipate when you when a new thing comes upon the stage to quickly acquire that knowledge to move and use it to your competencies this is a very important educational requirement that you must teach the children therefore when somebody says that you must teach them work life balance please believe me there is no such thing as work life balance this is a, this is not a problem this is a reality so those who have to work they have to work continuously hard to remain where they are and leave alone conquering new places and creating new disruptive technologies new disruptive methods of doing things so i have a feeling that just sustainable careers can only come from continuous education continuously re reeducating yourself continuously looking at the various changes that are taking place looking at the what you call what has not happened what has changed something has changed and that change we should be able to notice and taking cue from that rearm yourself to deliver that you may be we are not as lucky as our forefathers who did the same kind of agriculture for decades and even centuries now it changes everything 
the, the, the word is now coined as precision agriculture. It's a whole new ball game as to how do you implement precision agriculture. So without education, without the technical knowledge, without the ability to continuously absorb new things, you will not be able to cope with this enormous change that is coming upon us faster than ever before. So I think our education systems need to be improved to teach people what they need to absorb and what it takes for them to deliver what they are doing well for society, without which they will not satisfy the need of society and will be thrown out of the market. Because it all begins with the needs of society. And that's why when it started becoming bigger, one cobbler could not cope with anything more than a few villages. You needed serious manufacturing companies and distribution companies and shops to deliver that shoe now to the rest of society. So we need to understand this change. And as we come along, there will be some people who will go out of a job. How do we sustain them? How do we retrain them fast enough? Does the education system have any laid out parameters of how do I retrain somebody who knew something else altogether? And now that has gone out. And now what do we do? Well, the Indian farmer did that. When artificial indigo came, sugar cane, uh, uh, indigo production in India came to a standstill. All lands in the northern plains were almost vacant and waste. Till somebody came up with the idea that why don't we plant sugar cane there? Though not the most fertile soil for sugar cane, it quickly replaced uh, <coughs> indigo in order to give the farmer. Sir, so the farmer had to make this basic up. difference. So, Ajit, in sir, this context, we'll have one minute to yeah, so in this context, what I would like to say is that we are going to sit in a continuously changing world. It's going to be fast changing. It's going to be a disruptive changing world, preparing our students to continuously change and absorb the way to change is a very important aspect of creating a sustainable career. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, well taken that adaptability, continuous learning, understanding the need of the society. And uh, with that, we also look at profit and how much is needed to be in the system and be in the society. And moving forward now, uh, we have with us uh, Vice Chancellor Dharmesh Shahji of Industrial University. So you have 10 minutes. Good afternoon, all. <coughs> I think the uh, thing is very clear. Today, if somebody talk about, talks about sustainability, then sustainability of a career is also important. And what all things we need to do as an academician so that the young minds, which we are sending them to the industry or uh, society, they actually become a sustainable, uh, their career becomes a sustainable. See, we need to understand, I think, uh, uh, earlier speaker rightly said that today we are living in a VUCA world. It's completely volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. We know how academics were going on before corona, and immediately after, at the time of corona, how we change from a classroom mechanism to the online mechanism. And probably, if this would have might been forced to us as an academician, we may have never agreed. The online class to possible in ESR, right? But the change, so when the environment changes, we also have to see how quickly we or our students can get adapted. So we also have to continuously think on that side when we define a curriculum. And with the NEP 2020, probably this openness is given to us. There is a debate, the why, but at least if we give an opportunity to them, there is a possibility that they'll be able to sustain in the market when they go out. And when it comes to the student's output, we always think about a placement. But why only placement? We need job creators as well. So instead of only having a job seekers, we also have to think differently that why don't we create job givers? And if the content has been built up around that, 
individual, even if they go for a job, they become an entrepreneur. So we need ent entrepreneurs as well as entrepreneurs in the organization. Because today, we have to see that every individual is doing multiple tasks. Even as an academician also, we know that apart from an academic responsibility, we do a lot of other administrative responsibility also. So same thing goes to the industry environment today. Industry is not having that luxury of having a good band strength. So in order to reduce the band strength, they want people to do more or a multitasking kind of a people so that it becomes easier for them to employ on their role. So probably what we need to look at is that we need to train our students and firstly probably the faculty also that they are open to flexible work hours. Because today with the hybrid kind of an environment that we have, either at our institute level or at their organization level, there is a possibility of having a working at a place or work from home. And when it becomes a work from home, the flexible working hours are always there. So that mindset needs to be clear. I think Dr. Gulab Chandani has rightly said there is nothing like a work-life balance. It is, it, is, it, up, it is up to us that what is the limit that I want to stretch to ensure that I am also okay with my uh, work, family life. So probably that flexible working hours aspect we need to ensure by some means. Technological changes. AI is coming up, but it's not necessary that AI is going to take away the jobs. Probably in the next, next few years, a person with an AI knowledge will be more useful than an individual without an AI knowledge. It's not the only AI knowledge is going to be utilized. Another mindset that society has, come, uh, has got is that AI means only the computer science. But no, that's not true. AI requires a learning principles from the different domains. Because if somebody, if, let us say if I want to design a building or a structure of a building, then I need a knowledge on how the structure has been designed. And then only those principles have been used or those data has been again used to train the AI model and then only I'll be able to design an AI model. So I need a structural background as well. Same thing when it comes to the medical imaging also, I need a data from the doctor, CT scan images or digital images and if this data has been understood properly, then only the model can be trained and this model can be utilized in future to diagnose the disease. So it's important today that student needs to be trained on a multi-domain rather than a single discipline. So there is nothing like a civil engineer or a mechanical. There needs to be an engineer or a, any graduate who has a multi-domain knowledge across the board. Again, important here is comes is the agile mindset because when it comes to changing from one domain to other domain, student, we need to ensure that by carrying out different activities in a campus, we develop an agile mindset in our students that okay, these are the changes that they may come. Let us say if I'm working on hybrid platform and I have a team. I have not met, met my team members at all. So how are I going to build a team building? Because normally when we say an eye to eye contact or a physical contact actually helps us to make a good team. But here we are working on a remote location. We are not, we are only seeing them on the cameras. How are you going to build a team? So these kind of changes are going to come, un unexpectedly going to come in the near future. So we are, have to ensure that our teachers as well as our students are being trained in a way so they have a completely agile mindset to change or take over the, adapt to the various situations on a runtime basis. As a leader in the institute, we also have to adapt, be adaptive to the various changes because otherwise we will not be able to do the same thing because it is easy to say, but as a leader, if I don't, if I'm not adaptive to the changes, then I'll not be able to deliver it to my students and same is not going to get propagated at, at the other end also. Today, one of the important thing that I think uh, we all agree is digital platforms. We are utilizing digital platforms and social media like anything for various activities, convey messages, video conferencing, and everything. But what about our security? So we also have to ensure that cyber security, digital platform security has been properly ensured and has been taught to the students. Even like when it comes to the IC, recently in one of the ICC meeting, we had a similar issue, a, a photograph of a girl has been morphed in a campus. Right now, the student is not aware about what, how, why, when they are sharing the photographs, they don't know whether there is a WhatsApp, there is one feature called one time. So if they are sharing some photograph, it is only one time. When they see it, and then it is gone. Second time, they will not be able to open it. So if my students are not aware about the various features available with the tools and technology on a social media or a digital platform, then they are being mishandled. 
So it is on us that we see how the tools and technology of the social media and the digital platform can be effectively utilized to monitor the security of individuals and ensure that they are safe on a digital platform when they are utilizing the social media as well. Again, data literacy. We know data is a uh, next goal. Today, WhatsApp is giving us a free services, but that's not a free. They are collecting huge amount of data every day. Facebook is collecting huge amount of data, and this data is being analyzed by them, and they cater your needs. Just one minute, I'll take you. I'll finish it within time. So it takes, they are running out of it. So if the similar thing, because in my campus also, when there are students, when their students are appearing in exam, then they are there, when they are filling up the forms, they are actually giving us a lot of data. So this data is to be properly handled and secured. And then again, at the same time, we also need to understand how this data can be analyzed to ensure the various MIS-based activities that we do, because our decision needs to be based on this data, which helps us to take a proper decision and that also ensures the financial stability. Because again, financial literacy is not being taught to the student or the faculty. Then many times when they plan the activity, they don't think about how much cost is going to occur. And when they make a project report also, the same thing happens. So when, while preparing the project report or a grant proposal also, if we look at how various financial components are involved into this, then probably students will be able to take it up further when they go to the industry and or they, at they start with their own entrepreneurship, right? So what I want to, at the end of the day, convey is that in order to have a sustainable career for any student, they need to understand the changes that are happening very fast. They need to be adaptive. They need to know the technology. They should be aware about the cybersecurity and limitations of the digital platforms. And they should not worry at all about anything that is going to change because things are going to change by, by any means, whether you accept it or not. So you need to be adaptive to adapt the changes. Otherwise, you are lost and you will not be able to have a better career. So again, uh, thank you very much for an opportunity provided. And this is what it is. Thank you. Hello. Thank you, Dr. Dharmeshri. And you rightly pointed out that uh, multitasking, you started with that and coming to even how NEP is so important uh, uh, and influences uh, the dy dynamic workforce. Flexible workers, remote work redefines the conventional work-life balance. And you also touched upon how artificial intelligence applications have to be taught in different domains, even touched upon cybersecurity. Uh, Many points you have touched across, and of course, there'll be many questions uh, on this. Moving forward, we have the third speaker, uh, Professor Dr. Harpreet Kaur, Vice Chancellor, National Law University, Jodhpur. Over to you, ma'am. I have PowerPoint, so it can be shared. Please share the PowerPoint. Yeah. So since only uh, 10 minutes are given, I will uh, be quick. And uh, so uh, when uh, I received the letter from Dr. Pankaj Mittal that I have to speak on sustainable career or sustainability, career sustainability. So as a professor of corporate sustainability who has been researching and writing on it, I thought that let me see that what sustainability means for a career. So, and I found to my surprise, this was as simple and as complex as it has been for the career, for the corporate sustainability. So let's just look at, you know, how do we define a career and then we come to the, you know, career uh, sustainability. So if you go by the definition of career, what we see that, you know, it's the pattern or sequence of work experiences that evolve over a period of time and that is for the life, over the life of a person. So anyone who is engaged into very, uh, any work-related activity is supposed to have a career. And historically we have seen when we say that a person is a career-oriented person, we always say that there is high level of work commitment, professional status, and there is very you know, fast, rapid upward uh, mobility or stability in any occupation. Whereas many of the, the researchers who are working in this, they have not agreed to this kind of understanding of the career. Now, how do we define then career, uh, career sustainability? So I, some of the researchers, they have borrowed this definition from the Brundtland definition of uh, uh, sustainability. 
and it says that protecting and uh, fostering rather than depleting human and career development with a focus on balance and renewal is sustainability. So then why, you know, this discussion has become important now, why not earlier? So the discussion has become important because of the certain changes. The changes include rise in precarious work, work conditions, growing job and economic insecurity, eroding health benefits, longer working hours, and associated stress. So when we have these kind of issues, and COVID-19 has been the, uh, the situation we have already seen, so we started discussing about sustainability of the careers. So what are the benefits of sustainable career? Obviously, economic needs have to be taken care of. One's core career and life values are fitting with the career. Uh, there is flexibility and capability to evolve to see, suit one's changing needs and interests, and also renewability that individual has a regular opportunities for rejuvenation. Now, let us look at this interface also. These three terms, they are you know, interchangeably, or I would say they, they are connected to each other, career, employability, and economic growth. And uh, so we know that career and employability, they are impacted by economic growth of any country, and economic growth is a prerequisite for increasing production, and which also depends upon not only on the rate of the growth, but also on the efficiency with which the growth translates into job creation. So if I take you to 1991 economic reforms, liberalization, privatization, and globalization, we started having global careers. We started having private careers. We had a boom of service sector later on. Now, for last few years, we are focusing on the manufacturing. Then there have been inter interruptions of uh, digitalization and technological interventions. All of them, they give us an indication that how the employability or the employment should be created. Now comes the questions that, what are the dynamics of a career? So how uh, one would, would react to such kind of economic changes or employability? So the, the career dynamics says that every career or employment is not only influenced, but has interdependence on surrounding social spaces and which have a, barrier, which have a bear, bearing on the individual reactions. That means I may be one person working in the same organization, but my reaction to organizational policies will be different. And similarly, vice versa, the reaction of my, to my reaction by the organization will be different. So how do we understand this point? We understand this point with this ecosystem. We need to understand that every career system has an ecosystem which has certain contexts. And these contexts are very complex contexts because you can see that there are influences of individual, the demography from which area the person is coming, the age factor, the personality, the attitudes. We were saying that by 2023, India will be the youngest demography, right? Now we are reaching to the stage that within 20 next years, we'll be having moving towards the age, aged, you know, demography. So are we, we have already started working on it. No, we have not. Then comes the organizational, you know, strategies, policies, and practices. Then national laws, economics, labor market, culture, and then regional and global you know, politics, societies, regionalization, globalization, all these contexts, they have a bearing on, you know, uh, the career con continuity and the sustainability, right? The next point comes now with all these changes, how resilient the workforce is. So the career resilience becomes important because sustainability is not dependent only on the stability of the job, but the resilience to adopt to the change to develop and fit into ever-changing work environment, right? And resilience is related to the motivation theory. I'm not going to details. The paper I have already given maybe can be read. So the, what is the career insight and what is the career identity? One has to understand this point. So one has to be, you know, realistic about one's abilities and decide on what kind of career one would like to have and the degree with which they would relate to their career. There are changing dimensions of career, and I would not go into those dimensions because many of the previous speakers, on honorable previous speakers, they have already, uh, you know, uh, have uh, spoken about it. But 
there is a myth that I have written in the, in the red, that the myth that hard work, long hours, continuous employment, they promote career well-being, they are not aligned with the present reality. I think everybody would agree to this point because now the work which was pe previously assigned for 40 hours is now expected to be done in 20 hours or less than that. There are deadlines, the increased velocity, pacing, everything is there. So therefore, that means that if we are talking about the unlimited career opportunity, it has been modified now because modified not only because of the restructuring of the employment sector, but also because of the demands of the families and also the leadership roles. So the leadership roles, as the previous speaker was also saying, that you know, we have you know, certain things to be taken care of there also. So what are the stakeholders? All the institutions and macroeconomic as well as political factors, they, you know, they shape individual careers and their workforces. Industry is one such. The moment industry restructures, you know, the educational qualifications have to be restructured. The skill requirements are also required to be restructured. Organizations, they have to restructure. Now, if you have, you know, might have read it that that Indian multinational corporations, they are finding it very difficult to retain their CXOs and CEOs, the high-rise uh, high, high you know, careers. Why? So they are changing their policies that how they can, you know, uh, with the money, how they can retain or they can be anything else that can be taken up in the change in the policy. Along with that, obviously, education policy matters that we have already seen. Public policies are important because we have to depend upon the inclusion. Also the diversity, aging workforce, also the women workforce, and persons with disability. So we have to think about all of them inclusively. And then obviously personal attributes become very important. So when personal attributes become very important, that means the school education also becomes important here. It's not only about the higher education. Right, so what, what is my conclusion? My conclusion is that, that there are unpredictable nature of you know, contemporary careers, and there are complex factors which are embedded into it, so persons have to be you know, uh, prepared for it. There are transformation of the, of the career, of the traditional hierarchical uh, you know, employment trajectory. There is interplay of social spaces, so hyper, Personalized approaches are required by the organizations also. And at the individual also, one has to continuously prepare, one has to continuously prepare to enhance and develop the skill where the continuing education comes into. Now, India is aiming for SDG 8, which says that there has to be, you know, sustained, inclusive, sustainable economic growth full and uh, productive employment and decent work for all by 2030, right? It recognizes this fact that econo economic growth will be inclusive only if it creates jobs and decent works, right? So a certain level of foresight is required. And I would conclude by saying that any discourse on sustainability cannot be without reflecting upon its guiding criteria, values and principles, and it is subjective in nature and open to debate. Few points that I separately had noted down during the conversations of few of the, the speakers that I understand that job creation skilling is, 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 is required, but is it the only thing required? So my PowerPoint, I think, have increased, suggested these points. And uh, so we have to plan for our aging population also. I think the, the policy should also take care of this, and accordingly we should start preparing our you know, skilled force also. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Harpreet Kaur. Rightly defining sustainable careers and talking about is not merely about job stability, but also it revolves around various uh, aspects and adaptability being one of them. Continuous learning, resilience, uh, facing the change, and also talking about motivational theory and not forgetting inclusiveness. So thank you so much. Um, all three speakers have put their views and now the floor is open to discussion and question answers from the audience, please. Yes. Uh, may I request volunteers to please pass on the Hello. mic. Hello. 
Uh, Madam, my question requires a little bit of uh, contextual information. So am I permitted to do, do that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because no, then it becomes part of discussion. So uh, as far as we know that in earlier uh, economic paradigm, we used to have uh, the capital intensive industries and the labor intensive industries. So capital in intensive industries were mostly you know, concentrated in the rich countries, industrially advanced countries as we may call, and uh, labor intensive industries were in concentrated in India, China, Bangladesh and all that. The emerging uh, economic paradigm is that uh, uh, there is a brain-based economies and uh, 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 material-based, uh, material-intensive uh, uh, economies, and therefore brain-intensive countries and brain, in, sorry, uh, material-intensive countries. So, in brain-intensive countries, you have the, all the European countries, U.S., uh, Canada, Australia, and all that, and uh, material-intensive countries, you have India, China which are like called the factories of the world, uh, where all the polluting industries have been transferred to this part of the world, and uh, we take pride that we have 7% growth rate or 8% growth rate, as far as, uh, I mean, <laughs> those industries are concerned. Uh, another set of data is provided by the Hindu newspaper, uh, very interesting information and very alarming also. It says that uh, uh, in the uh, decade uh, 1980s, for 1% 1 increase of uh, GDP, um, it used to increase jobs to the tune of two crore people in India. And in the next decade, that is uh, 1990s, this increase in jobs was one, one crore 50 lakhs. So it went on decreasing. I don't know the present state of affairs, but all I know is another report by Center for Monitoring Indian Economy, which says that most of the jobs in India are being created at the lowest level of the strata, where you have the, the Swiggy people, the, the Ola, Uber uh, drivers, things like that, Zometo, and so many things, you know. As we know, they, they are part of life. And uh, very few jobs uh, for the people who are highly educated. So this is a part of a study conducted by uh, Center for Monitoring Indian Economy. So I, I want to know your take on this. Thank you. Whom you want to answer this? Are uh, you on my words? One other time. You want to put, or can I add something to this? All right. Uh, I wouldn't know the data. Uh, I will give this mic to other panelists also. But addressing this point of reduction in the uh, placements, uh, and we talk about in India, an economy affected because of that. Uh, I would go back to the colonial uh, time when we always Indians thought that you know we have to work under somebody, but by birth, over if you study the ancient India, we were always entrepreneurs. So somewhere the answer lies is that uh, lower strata, yes, the economy is uh, uh, being affected and the job profile is being affected, but somewhere entrepreneurial mindset would be the answer if this data is falling down, and this is, needs to be addressed. Uh, looking at every sector which would actually uh, accelerate the, uh, the, the placement in that area. Where are we taking, where are we driving our uh, students or the future generations to? So this requires debate and this requires a lot of uh, uh, you know, input from all the educationists uh, with regard to this issue and turning their mindset into entrepreneurial mindset would be the answer. education system, students are with us for two years or three years or four years. Alumni connect is uh, almost nil. So is it possible that we'll be ensuring sustainable career for the outgoing student for the entire life? The only bottom line is whatever two years you have, three years you have, four years you have, if a first placement is very good, his, his or her career is sustained. That is my take. I think coming back to the point which is raised, what I understand is that this data is regarding the placement. But we also need to look at the data which relates to the startups, entrepreneurs, as well as students going abroad for higher studies. Probably these number of students going abroad for higher studies has increased by large during this period. 
So probably if we look at all data collectively, then only, pro then only probably we'll be able to actually analyze the issue and then probably uh, take a corrective measures if required. Uh, I would only like to add this point that we have only one-sided data. I would also request you to look at the po population, the demography. You know, so how many people are within the working age or uh, the age which is, which is as per the law where they can work? What is the percentage of that population? And in respect to the, you know, jobs which are created. So if we have level-wise um, the population uh, demography also, I think then it will be better for us we'll be able to have a better analysis also that the, the hypothetical or the, the report which has been created, whether it, it is skewed on one side or not. And it also depends upon, uh, you know, the type of employment or the type of economic uh, economy's growth also, because if we are having disruptions of digitalization and the new fields are coming up, so there are both the sides of jobs are being created. It's only that uh, as a member of the society, we are only able to see, okay, Swiggy is there, Zomato is there, Spotify is there, gig workers are there. And we never cared about gig workers till the time we started amending our Contract Labor Act and started having the, uh, the regulations for the gig workers on also. But simultaneously, the changes in at the higher level also so why the competition authorities, they had to be all of a sudden become vigilant because of the mergers and acquisitions, because of the digital platforms coming up, because of the Swiggy taking up all the orders, because of the high discount rates offered by the Swiggy and not passing uh, the benefit to the restaurants which are, you know, uh, in, which are registered on their platforms. So at both the sites, the work is going on. So jobs are also created, restaurants are also being given a platform to, you know, to offer their food services uh, or their catering services just at a stroke of, you know, one app only, right? So it's not that only at one side the, the, the working, the workforce is there, but the work for the others is also. But it's only, only thing is that, that it has such a huge impact that so much of research is going on in the commercial laws area. I'll, I'll just give you one example here. A, a company, when it is incorporated, it has to give what are its objectives. So if it's an airplane manufacturing company, we'll write airplane manufacturing, right? We'll also write as ancillary, we cannot write now ancillary, we can say that, okay, the, the byproducts or certain smaller parts of the aircrafts will also be there. But if the same company starts going into manufacturing of coffee, right? We have so many examples here, so many companies diversifying. Earlier they used to do in the same company, now they have their own subsidiary companies, new objects are given and something, everything is given. So you see that, it doesn't come from one thing. It is, it is a cycle in which all the stakeholders, they are involved in creating such kind of a situation that jobs are seem to be created only at one side of the road, but not on the other side of the road or not on the median of the road. So we need more research to be done into it and then probably we'll be able to find an answer. My question is that with uh, AI-enabled jobs, uh, we know that uh, every maybe 10 years we'll have to relearn and have a new kind of job. Uh, a farm worker can continue to be a farm worker throughout life, and that has been the case for several hundred years. But in the last 100 years or so, we think that educated person also, once you become an engineer, you become a clerk, you can retire as a clerk or retire as an engineer, whereas that is not going to be the case. And because of that, our education length has progressively kept on increasing. And if you say that, okay, somebody is going to study for 20 years and have a 40 years career, that seems viable. But today, if you say that 20 years learning and 10 years career, and you have to again learn for five years, that's not going to be viable. So do you see a reduction in the total length of study before a person starts working? This is not in the hands of any one individual, or for that matter, even a government. People are innovating, 
destructive new technologies are coming even in agriculture. It is not true that you go on doing agriculture for life and centuries. American population that did agriculture 200 years ago was about 45-50%. Today it is not even 2%. So the farmer is not playing the farmer again. So there is a lot of change that's coming out in the way we conceive our needs, our way of providing those needs. And then you come out with what is happening. And based on that, we in the education field need to understand what do we need to impart to the students so they can survive in this changing environment. This is a very important aspect. Now, can you say exactly what? No. That you have to change, one. And second is, you will have to acquire new skills regularly, upgrade your skills on one side, and acquire new skills if you want to stay in the game of employment. And I mean employment here, whether it is self-employed or employed in the institution, is one and the same thing. So most of the times, uh, we teachers seem to teach the student a skill. Rather than that, we have to teach the student how to be continuously learning, so that one can adapt throughout the life career, yeah. right? And schools will have to devote some space to those who want to come in at any age to study. I think in the software industry also that is true, right? I think there we started with the C programming. Really true. Today nobody talks about C, C++ programming, right? So it's not only to farmers. Almost in all industry, when the technology changes, people has to change. I think your car also has changed with the technology. The brighter side of it, yesterday, just an incident, uh, we had International Year of Millets uh, at HSNC University, and we had farmers uh, visiting us. And there were millet printers. There were farmers who were talking and who are employing 200 students ready to take interns. And their uh, turnover is uh, 1.5 crore monthly, 50 crores. And they've got, uh, but I mean, a lot of funds from government. And they are creating now that work culture that they are asking us, please give all your students as interns. So now farmers' children have become entrepreneurs and they have businesses across the globe. They have in Germany and they showed the entire, in, in, in US and UK, they have uh, almost their shops and their uh, outlets in even airports. So this was wonderful to hear the journey. So now it is not the story, story is changing and Indian story is changing. So my question is targeted to Shri Gulab Chanji because he is from the industry. So you are the one who are absorbing the students which our universities produce. So what I want to know is that uh, many of the reports are saying that many of our graduates are unemployable, they lack the skills. So what exactly is lacking in them? I mean, curriculum, attitude to work, attitude to adapt to changes, or experiential learning, and whatever your response is, how to correct it at the university level. See, our education hasn't changed to give you a new kind of the same engineer. For example, when Mikmar started as a demand of the industry to build capacity for project managers and construction management, we found that the industry took to it immediately because this is a postgraduate course. So every civil engineer they got, they needed three to five years to actually deliver work as, as it should be. Whereas this Nikma graduate learned management and therefore became useful to the company almost immediately. And as a result, you could find that there is a value to be taken from this. So if you look at the jobs that you're looking carefully and tweak them to what is really needed, what is really missing here, and this will have to do regularly. While we do worry about many students, most of you have to worry a bit about whether AI will replace you. AI can very easily do the regular teaching work. So our teachers have to work so that they cannot, they should not be replaced. No, I think, <laughs> I, I, I think that teachers will never be replaced by anyone. I have strong conviction about it because the human interface is always important and the adaptability, we are not dependent upon any software. We are, we are what we are because of our circumstances, because of our upbringing, because of our learning, because of our knowledge, because of our wisdom, experience, everything. So how can we be replaced? 
I don't agree to this point that teachers can always be. Yes, teachers have to work really hard in order to keep themselves updated and bring something, you know, change your pedagogy style and, uh, you know, keep yourself updated. Um, there is so much of information available everywhere. So I think we don't have to So uh, what he wants to say is that the good teachers cannot be replaced, but bad teachers can be replaced. Yeah, so, so we have to remain no, so good. This every use artificial intention to enhance your pedagogy, you will get an improvement. You will need a much higher learning and understanding to be able to teach this new, new kid who wants what, how to survive in that. So I think this is all, this is by way of a lighthearted view. Yes, I, I agree to this point, but yeah. And then, uh, like I also say the same, right, that we need a person with an AI knowledge. AI may not be replacing everything, but if you have an AI knowledge, then probably it can help to individualize the learning experiences as well. And it also depends upon the area of specialization also. You know, what kind of uh, course you are teaching or what is your area of specialization, that's also uh, is important. Yes, use of AI for improving your evaluation patterns, you know, your course uh, curriculum or you know designing of the courses presenting it in the better form in the in the classroom those things can be there but uh, for example chat gpt it created so much of ruckus all of a sudden everybody was so disturbed but turnitin came up with one little change in its software and we are able to take care of that kind of copying right so yes. i think uh, that that that's how it will work uh, also, there's an importance if you want to add to the improvement of the learning, teaching learning system and people to learn. We must remember one thing. Dr. Somnath, the chief of ISRO, after the Chandrayaan success, was giving a series of meetings with industry, with education institutions. And he brought out one thing. He says, I want to point out one important feature. Not one of the scientists engineer or anybody working with ISRO is, a, is from IIT. Yes. Because when we wanted people from IIT, they were chasing money rather than they were chasing the kind of job that's required. So what you have done, Mangalayan, is, not so much, Chandrayan, has been done by people that came from town three, town two, city colleges. That is not to say that the IIT is not fit for the job. But you were chasing the money. Whereas this guy was willing to work for an institution like that with pride. So we need to also improve the teaching learning method in which we te teach people not only just to seek money in their l job, but also to seek a certain element of uh, contribution that they would like to make, which can in the end make them better. Uh, very good afternoon. Here. Yeah. Very good afternoon. Uh, myself, Shiv Tripathi from Atmiya University, Rajkot. Thanks to all the panelists for wonderful contribution. Uh, when it comes to the economy and the skilling, what I see that it's more of a distribution problem. Because when the technological disruptions are happening, nature of jobs are changing, then how we distribute the wealth, and for that there are new types of job roles, new skilling requirements. Now, on the one side, this is the contextual situation. On the other side, no one university is similar to another university. Every university has its own context. Some are rural, some are urban, some are in city, some are vertical, some are horizontal, and number of. How do we map the changing requirements so that this wealth distribution can be more sustainable? I think that's one area where universities can collaborate. Uh, Madam, I think, mentioned about collective action and involving multiple stakeholders. It I would appreciate if there could be some reflections on it. The, the next round of, uh, you know, work can be assigned, uh, you know, having this brainstorming session and uh, distributing the work different, different areas of research. And area-wise, the groups can be created and groups can start working on it. And, uh, you know, if we have dedicated brains working on something, I'm sure that, you know, solution will be there. And it's, it's a, 
when we you are talking about economic you know distribution so from public policy to economic policy to every stakeholder will be involved here and uh, so government representation is here university representations are here um, the industry will also be be involved and definitely we can work out uh, you know some formula for it some suggestions policy documentation can be prepared we have to be ready because you know as i said that we when we were there was a time when when i wrote that okay 2023 india will be having the youngest population skilled skilled now that that peak has reached and now we are on the decline side we have to be prepared for the next round of aged workers how to retain how to ensure their sustainable sustainable careers we have to now work towards that side also so you know 50 vice chancellors are here uh, uh, I think AIU can can take a call on it. That's my request. Thank you, sir. No, no, I just take one more yeah. Uh, yes. Well, thank you. Uh, very interesting discussions. A uh, couple of points. We are talking of dynamic workplace, or rather dynamic work. But probably to me, what we are little worried about is the onslaught of technology. Technology has rapidly evolved in last couple of years and we are little uncertain about it we are not very sure where it's going to take us and therefore all these uncertainties but i mean technology use of technology is in our hands how we are really going to use this technology if technology is going to be our master or if technology is going to be our subservient so a lot of it all depends on how we navigate this technology and a lot of these discussions whether we will be replaced or will not be replaced is because of the uncertainty. We don't know where it's going to go, at what pace it is going to go and therefore I think what I feel is that the, uh, continuous learning and uh, continuing professional development activities. That's something which lack in our formal, syllab uh, formal academic structures. We don't have, I mean, once we get a degree, then I think that's about it. Somebody may be attending conferences, workshops, or maybe doing some additional uh, training or courses, but there is no structured professional development activity. So unless, of course, this is imbibed that, OK, every two years, every three years, every five years, whatever it is, we need to upgrade our skills and we need to be relevant to the current needs of whatever our learners or stakeholders or whoever it be. So that's one thing that we need to focus on. And I think if we are able to do that, I'm sure that with all these dynamisms, we'll still be able to evolve. I can add one line. I will only say I appreciate uh, this uh, point of view because uh, when we talk about 21st century skills, the same skills were required in, in, in 20th also. Because it has been ever evolving. The time it was a typewriter, that may, uh, these, the people had to learn typewriter, then computer. So we have been accepting the technological advancement. We'll continue to advance. That's a wonderful point. But what is that? Uh, after discussion, uh, to this answer, I would say uh, dynamism in the workplace and actually the work culture we have to develop the resilient uh, uh, generation that are they resilient enough to face the challenges and be there without affecting their mental health and accepting and adopting and adapting. So both are they welcoming. So this is what we need to work at. Work at. Apart from skills, skills and NEP is actually brought in that uh, paradigm shift. We have to see to it that other value system are we uh, continuing to uh, uh, give and uh, to our next generation and was very well taken because even 22nd century there will be some technological advancement and this will continue. So I don't know whether we have time, Madam. Uh, yeah. Last, Last question. question. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> Madam, a very nice discussion. Mindset is required for sustainable development. And it should be percolated from secondary onwards, secondary education onwards. Even in our degree programs and PG programs, one has to ask, means we have to ask, that is whether our syllabi is <coughs> employment oriented, skill oriented, or entrepreneurial motivated oriented. Once the syllabus is framed, it has to be changed. Board of Studies has to be so dynamic and industry people should be involved in the Board of Studies so that from the first year itself, the curricula has to be prepared in such a way that where 
the industry need and their modules as far as our credit system is concerned has to be incorporated. Otherwise, that sustainability only will be discussed and it is not going to be possible to practice it. This is my suggestion. Wonderful. Uh, I would add one line to this again because uh, I, we are, HSNC University is the uh, first uh, cluster university in state uh, which was governed by a private trust. And when you are first one, you do not know from where to start and how to go about, and you have to be ready with the challenges. And I was talking to Dr. Pankaj Mithalji, and I told her that I will start with this example, but I want to end with this. Uh, quickly, we didn't know what changes to bring in curricula and how much. And you're de-affiliating from a larger umbrella, which is University of Mumbai. It was a great challenge. One thing when we talk about sustainability, sustainable careers, have we asked the next generation what do they expect from the institutions? So I believe we were the university who created student advisory board. And student advisory board who was studying with us, not alumni. And they told us, the students of BMS said, ma'am, we go out to learn Python. They also learn the uh, IT, uh, even softwares. They learn Unity. They learn so many other softwares. They are in filmmaking. They may be learning management studies. In media, they're going for journalism outside. So what is it that your curriculum has to be as rightly pointed out? And this was a driving force. The Board of Studies, we, our uh, entire notification says our constitution of Board of Studies have five industry experts. We have alumni who are already established. We have senior administrators, senior academicians in that area who have expertise in that. So to understand what industry needs, what society needs, as I mentioned, is very important what we need and we take it forward. So making students a part of your decision making body, I think this, uh, they would tell us more how to help their careers to be sustainable, what challenges they are facing. So it's not that always from we have to be givers and we have to be uh, to deliver the curriculum is about what they need also. So need will come from them. All the senior members who are alumni or they have established, they actually drive the change. So I believe I again take this point wonderfully well. Yes, quickly because we need to wind up and the just next uh, session is uh, just like done. When we have the board of studies, normally we freeze our syllabus 100%. Why do we keep that? We know basics are still basics. So keep the basics at as a 60% or a 70% and keep the 30% open and change it every year with industry or student advisory board. So you don't have to call your BOS every time and make a changes. Every year you can make 30% changes based on the society, society industry needs, right? Yeah. No, give it open and uh, give the authority to the vice chancellor. If you really want to be dynamic, give the authority. Let us take that as a board uh, approval itself, that these 30 percent will be approved as per the recommendation of dean by the vice chancellor. That's all. Vice chancellor this can is be okay, but as first requirement is for BOS uh, yes, approval. Yes, Organizers okay. are waiting uh -huh. to felicitate the oh, speakers. Yes. Thank you so much, Dr. Bagla. It was a very, very inspiring and, you know, interesting session. Uh, I request Dr. Suresh Ukrande to please come up on stage again and, uh, you know, gift uh, the mementos to the guests over here. I thank uh, Dr. Dharmesh Shah and uh, Dr. Harpreet Kaur and uh, Mr. Rajit Gulabjan for being here with us and sharing their thoughts. Thank you so much. And last but not the least, I would like to thank on behalf of SVU as well as um, AIU for being here with us today and engaging in very, very interesting sessions and discussions. Uh, we'll break, we'll have a very, very short five minute, you know, handover to the next session, uh, people, uh, just before uh, we begin. Yeah. Thank you. Please keep coming. Please keep coming one after the other. Yeah. Before we begin the next session, uh, the tea will be served here in the auditorium itself. There won't be a tea break. <laughs> yes. Because I think we're running short of time.
सही लाइट कम Oh yeah, we'll just have a short five-minute break before we have the next session. I mean, <laughs> no, no, yeah, just a five-minute. The tea will be served here itself. Yeah. I was told. Let me cross-check. Yeah, let me cross-check then. Yeah. Sir, tea will be served here itself. Yes, I cross-checked. Yes, yeah. 